Hello and welcome. Today I'm with Professor Ian Thompson, who leads Worldwide Generations work around sustainability strategy. And we're here to talk about the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, or as it's more commonly known, CSRD. Hi Ian, welcome. Hi Simon, thanks. So Ian, the, the CSRD is, uh, I suppose, an, uh, an add-on to the Non-Financial Reporting Directive, which is currently in place, covering about 11,500 plus companies. Yeah. Um, why, why is it needed? Things change. I mean, the, the Non-Financial Reporting Directive came out around about 2014, and that was before the UN Sustainable Development Goals. It was before the... Um, EU Green Deal. It was it, it was kind of for a different time. It, this is a natural evolution to the to the sort of like the non financial reporting directive, which, as you said, was very much restricted to a specific group of companies, largely focusing on you know kind of financial financial type and a lot very large financial type institutions. And it, it really reflects the change in times, the change in commitment, um, either with, within business, within the, the EU, different nations within the EU, and the different uh, acceptability or maybe the unacceptability of unsustainable practices. So it's very much a, something which is designed within a wider program of, of activities, which the non-financial report and directive wasn't it, it just simply was uh was for a different different time reflecting particularly the UN sustainable development goals and also the kind of EU Green Deal, which are really kind of much more holistic, much more kind of like structured, systemic approaches to kind of like to change change the world and the world of business. And and what, what are the, the sort of differences between NFRD and the proposed CSRD, and what are, what are the sort of time scales and the, the numbers we're talking about? Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's um, there's a there's a few few kind of like differences. I mean, I think one is the the scope of the the CSRD, which covers a kind of a wider range of kind of issues again connected to the sustainable development goals. So the scope of the CSRD is different. It also includes evaluation of kind of the business model strategy. It's got a forward looking focus as well on it. So it includes transition plans, key targets, you know, kind of ES, ESG targets, um, a range of different things. And it covers, you know, kind of anti corruption. It's got sort of human rights, social impact, as well as environmental, environmental kind of like impact. So in, in many ways, the scope of it is different. As, as I mentioned before, it's really tied in with the EU Green Deal. So it's aligned with a political kind of like series of, of transitions that actually goes on. The other thing is the, the types of organization it was it was kind of like linked to. So the non-financial reporting directive was relatively focused on a particular group of large organizations. In 2025, all of the companies that are currently reporting on the non-financial reporting directive have to kind of like to report um, according to the CSRD. It's a larger, more comprehensive set of set of kind of like data points. Then we kind of move on to um, 2026, where virtually all large um, kind of companies based in the EU op and operating in the EU. And large is a sort of like a balance sheet of um, about 220 million uh, euros and a turnover greater than uh, 40 million euros um, and over 250 employees. It's it's one of these size tests that you've got to kind of qualify for any two of those three kind of like issues. So it's based on asset base, based on your turnover and your employee. And you kind of pick the you, any of those two match. You're a large company. And then you need to comply by about 2026. And then perhaps the bigger move is in 2027, when um, almost all listed small medium enterprises um, in, in EU regulated stock exchange are, are then going to require. That's a big shift because then we're talking about moving up to possibly about 50,000 companies 
needing to comply with that. But they're not finished there. They've then got another stage, which is, you know, for 2029, it includes any company that actually kind of like has a significant operation in the EU, even though they, they're not based in the EU. Now there you're you're kind of like a, a kind of you've got a different set of qualification. You must have at least one subsidiary or branch operating in the EU territory. And if you like, the overall turnover is around about 150 million euro. So it's like big companies, but it's for their operations in, in EU. So if you're based there and you're listed on a stock exchange, you're going to have to comply. If you're operating in the EU and you're a large company, you're also going to have to comply, even though you're kind of not necessarily based in the EU or headquartered in the EU. If you operate in the EU, by kind of 2029, you're going to have to pre uh, prepare these reports as well. So you can see it's much more inclusive in terms of the types of information that, that's required. It's also much more kind of like inclusive in terms of the type of organizations that are actually going to be there. We're moving really from large uh, EU-based financial kind of institutions to any company that's really listed and uh, operating in the EU territorial space. So that's something you know to be considered for UK companies. They're not exempt. You know, we've kind of left the EU, but if you have a substantive part of your business, which a lot of UK businesses did, they maybe set up a subsidiary um, kind of on the on the continent, you know, to allow them to for a made very kind of like good business sense to do that. Um, that part of their business could well be um exempt, particularly if it's set up as a separate company. Um, then it can, and it's listed anywhere, then it can actually kind of uh, fall within fall within the remit. The, the qualifications is a little bit complex. It's size-based um, and there's different time scale. And like all things EU, it, that may change slightly over, over time because the, the, all this needs to be integrated. This is the EU have issued the CSRD and needs to be enacted within national government's legislation and adopted. Um, within the kind of next, I think, 18 months. So there's um, there, it, there may well be slight variations in different nations depending upon their, their political process and the legislative um, agenda they've got in these different countries. So for any business that's in the EU or has a presence in the EU, what's the development of CSRD? Is it something I, I as a business in the area, I can actually start thinking about now reporting about now where, where are the people behind csrd with the development of the uh, directive again with as with most eu they, they it's not a, it's not a nice simple clean answer there's a there's a number of different kind of bodies and in, involved um involved in this process effectively it's a it's a eu commission who kind of like finalise the finalise the process and it goes through Parliament and uh, e European Parliament and and things like that to become kind of embedded within uh, within within practices. So it needs to become a directive, if you like, um, in in the process. It then needs to be there needs to be then links with national EU kind of like national standard setters type you know, um, type of kind of engagement in national kind of governments and regulations because everything needs to be harmonized with, within within the process. And very similar to what happened with the non-financial reporting directive. So there's, you know, it's a, it's a well-established established practice. The, I suppose maybe the, the slight issue is that the, the detail of the CSRD and the standards and the measurement protocols are under development. They're, they're not finalized. And so we have an organization called EFRAG, which is a European Financial Reporting Advisory Group. And they are they are kind of like a, a sort of like technical, technical kind of expert group where they they they're the ones who propose the draft standards, the draft protocols, and, and the different ideas. And they're made up of representative from different um, different industries, financial sector, you know, con consumer organization. We've got academics in there. We've got um, 
regulators, we've got representatives from the different countries and um, kind of key, key different countries involved. And then we also have um, civil society representatives like trade union, consumer organizations, as well as certain kind of like community community groups and sort of like trade union. So we have a kind of a, it's, there's a sort of like a, a, a body of different stakeholders, which are the, and that's important because one of the differences between the CSRD is it's not solely focused on investors. It's actually, it's got a wider remit in terms. So it's actually looking at um, different stakeholders. So it's a stakeholder orientated standard. So therefore you've got more stakeholders involved in the standard setting process. Um, is also policy, you got lots of kind of policy relevant as well, because there's lots of kind of issues there. And as I mentioned before, one of the key drivers of the CSRD is to channel funds towards growing the kind of businesses within the EU along a sustainable trajectory. So it does, it, so it looks at kind of like policymakers, public um, uh, finance providers, as well as regulators as well, because there's a regulatory dimension to this as well. You know, the data has been kind of like, is, you know, it's multi-purpose, um, which really makes it different from a lot of the other standards which were largely about providing data for um, in investors in the capital markets. But as this is actually a much more stakeholder orientated kind of a, approach for multi, multiple purposes. And so there's lots of different people involved in the process, but largely what you get is we've got a, a sort of an enabling framework that's been passed, you know, as a directive. And then the details are worked on by EFRAG, who go through lots of consultations, lots of, they design drafts, draft standards, draft protocols, which are then passed over to the commission. Commission then sort of like work on it. And then depending upon the recommendations, either they can be put forward as a commission type of, of kind of recommendations, or if they're more, radical and substantive they might need to go to the parliament for you know kind of like to be passed through the parliament and then enacted through national national governments so it's a little bit complicated but it, it is the it is the eu and the eu are trying to do something I, I don't want to kind of trivialize it but they're trying to do something quite radical here with actually taking something which is becomes part of a a transition plan for a whole <laughs> as a continent almost you know you know so like they're they're pushing forward a, a kind of quite a radical transformation plan so it's not trivial it's not just a little oh we'll change the way that we report things it's actually got a real kind of like goal to it which is transformative and it's about changing a whole economy of maybe one of the most important economic kind of like blocks that operates within the within the world right now i don't know if that's that that's kind of that's helpful a, but it but it but it is very much uh and i mean and for for any businesses or anybody it, it's 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 a really really kind of like significant transformation i mean really it's an important to keep on top of this to keep your eye on it to keep look at sort of like frag standard to keep in touch with your um, maybe if you've got a producer organization or some kind of like coalition there, because you really need to keep be aware of what's actually going on there. It's a lot of work for one business, but looking for kind of like um, networks, looking at kind of like different organizations who may be kind of like helpful to to assist this, because this is not it's not massively difficult to do but it is different and so therefore because of the, the extent of the difference it's actually going to require quite a lot of planning and quite a lot of of kind of organization waiting until it hits you is a really bad idea you know you want to almost be involved in the if you can in in the in the feedback to the standards if you've got something which is just going to be impossible for your sector you need to tell them because they, they, they might know or they might not know 
but because of the nature of it, it's like the other good thing about the EU, so it, make, it seems like it's a bit complicated, but there's lots of opportunity for engagement, you know, and if the fact that you don't engage, you know, they're going to go, well, you had the opportunity to talk about it. You had the opportunity to kind of come in and and do things. You didn't. How were we supposed to know? <laughs> you know, so look for consultation process. Look for opportunities to engage because there are opportunities to engage. Excellent. So one of the questions was going to, was going to be, actually, if I'm from a, a company that's not currently reporting on NFRD, um, do I do I just keep my head head down until uh, 2026 when it hits me, or is, is there something I can be doing in 2023? Is, is there, as you say, the consultation process? Should I should I be aligning my looking to align my reporting already and see seeing how I can I, do that? My kind of like my experience and a lot of the research in this area is that developing kind of high quality different accountability type exercises is a three year process you know um and and if you look at the companies who have you know have who have kind of like really transformed the way in which they do their their kind of like their reporting in relation to sustainability that this this is almost like a minimum kind of period so you first of all need to do a sort of like an order of what information you've got in relation to sustainability you know there's there's some they're really good summaries have, have i mean I, I think there's a couple of things to look at one is the it's it's a dreadfully kind of title thing it's the eu taxonomy of of sustainable economic activities it's it's kind of like you know it, it's there's not been a not a marketer involved in that simon as, as you'll kind of appreciate <laughs> There's also the sustainable finance disclosure regulations and, and there's a kind of like a whole kind of like movement which is actually going on there. Now, the taxonomy is a really useful list because what it does is it identifies sustainable activities. It's already got, there's, there's a really nice, really nice kind of web, website. I think it's, I think they call it a compass. There's where you just click on and it's like, it's all listed. You can download a spreadsheet, you can look at activities. And what you want to do as a precursor is to look at that uh, taxonomy to see the extent to which your business is considered is doing things which may or may not be sustainable. If they are, then you really need to start to particularly you need to look at what are the kind of the implications of this and follow on from the taxonomy into likely disclosure requirements and also look at business opportunities because a big, big part of the CSRD is actually looking at your strategy, your business plan, and looking at the risks and opportunities that the sort of like the green deal is, is actually going to bring, because you're going to have to disclose that. So the first thing you want to do is to think about what is your business model in relation to sustainable transformation? What, what are the kind of opportunities? What are the things you're maybe not going to be able to do in the future? And actually start to think about your kind of business model and then start to think of your kind of business model in relation to things like the broader sustainable development goals. Look at the connectivity between what you do and these goals. And that's where you know, organizations like G17 Eco are really useful because they've, they've done a kind of like a mapping, you know, in relation to what goes on. Similarly, the the UN kind of global compass is another example which have actually done that mapping for you. That's actually really important to do because you need to understand your connections. And it's actually starting to understand your connections with these goals and these wider kind of transformation process that actually are going to form the basis of the type of information you're going to have to start to do. So you need to do a bit of you know, I don't know, wargaming or kind of developing a kind of transformation playlist, look at your strategy, look at your business model, then look at the kind of like the implications, the threats, the risks and opportunities, and then start to think of what evidence and information would I need to now manage that process and actually starting to think about how am I going to start collecting that and then start doing a little bit. You've got that, what, are, what, what might we need and what have we got just now and do like a you know, kind of like a gap analysis in, you know, in terms of what's actually needed. And then start moving towards um, kind of start to collect data, maybe doing some pilots, some prototyping, 
and then sort of like moving forward in relation to that. Some stuff is really quite clear. You know, you're going to have to do stuff on greenhouse gas emissions. That, that's, you know, though, you know, you know, you know, whatever happens, that's going to need. You're going to have to start doing stuff on um, employee rights, you know, kind of like gender inclusion type of thing. You're going to have to have some some kind of things on there. You're going to be stuff on bribery and corruption, you know, kind of like what you're actually sort of like doing in, in relation to these. And there's also, you know, we just had COP15. We're going to have to, you're you know, going to have to look at stuff where you're, if your business is dependent on natural systems and bio, and, you know, thriving biodiversity, there's going to be information that's required on there, as well as a kind of a range of other other kind of issues that, that are actually there. Water's likely to be on there you know, kind of like energies. So a lot of stuff isn't going to come as a surprise, you know, and actually, to be honest, you sh if you're not, <laughs> if, you're not, if your business doesn't know what you're doing in relation to, you know, kind of diversity and inclusion in terms of gender at your kind of top level board, climate change, water use, natural resources, waste, or these sort of things there, You've kind of got a problem as a business because you're 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 not optimizing your kind of value value creation potential. Anyway, once you've got that, then you want to have a, almost a year of collecting that data and using it internally. And then once you've got that going and and working, by this stage the the standards will become more kind of like clear, more definite. You'll be able to know exactly what you want to do. And then in the third year, you're ready with kind of like good, verifiable and verified data. Because maybe I should have mentioned that this data has also got to be assured, which is very different from a lot of the other kind of um, standards where they recommend assurance by a third party, by a kind of like certified kind of third party. This also has to be assured, um, um, and there's a kind of a list of, of kind of like approved assurers already in the system. And um, and let's be, I'll be quite clear, including in FRAC, there's lots of auditors and there's lots of assurers on that committee. Is there? But the other thing is, is that this is the the plan is to move from what's called limited assurance, which is based on the information that you provided to us, the auditors, we don't see anything really bad, like um, that's, that's there. Um, limited assurance, you can't rely on that data, so you can't sue the assurers if you kind of like go, well, it was limited assurance. If you read the, read the small print, limited assurance means you can't rely on this data. But moving towards what they call reasonable assurance by 2028, 2029, which is the same standard as you do for financial reporting kind of um, uh, data. It's where you can rely on it. It is kind of certified um, to a certain standard that a kind of like a reasonable user of this data can rely on it because it's third party verified. So you're going to have to get your systems ready in place for assurance. So it's not just about doing it internally. So it's worth having a talk to your kind of like your auditor or what if you've got any assurers there, because they'll also be interested in this. So how is CSRD different to other existing frameworks and standards and how is it aligned to them as well? Yeah, that's 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 a good question. I mean, I think anyone who's involved in this in this space appreciates that there's um that there's a it's a really contested field. It's a really busy, congested field right now with lots of different standards, lots of um, different um, approaches to do to solving this this largely problem of providing markets, stakeholders, business partners, civil society, policymakers, government agency with reliable, relevant, and comparable um, kind of social, environmental. <laughs> economic and governance um, kind of like data to allow them to make better better decisions. So there's a range of different um, standard setters with that same sort of goal, which are actually trying, trying to do that. Now, the often the other goals are, are the other standard setters are, are slightly different. So if we look at the IFRS, ISSB standard and the, some like SASB, 
they're very much kind of driven by providing data for investors and looking at what we call kind of financial materiality or almost like quite short term impact on the financial performance of the of the business. The CSRD is, 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 is actually kind of like stepping back from that and is actually looking at what it, it uses a sustainable materiality assessment often referred to as, as double materiality where you look at the financial you know, of course we need to look at the, fin- the impact of these things on the on the kind of the financial um financial performance of a business but it also looks at the impact that the business has on different social and in economic and environmental systems as well. So it looks at the, that kind of like that external impact and also looks at the impact that the changes in these kind of like unsustainability, we carry on the same trajectory, will have on the future of the business. It really sort of like, and that's similar to the Global Reporting Initiative, which kind of again adopts a kind of a, a double materiality kind of impact in terms of is it and it recognizes that the value creating potential of a business is not disconnected from social and ecological systems but rather that those social ecological systems can act as a constraint on the business to be able to do it either by you know we don't we we run out of electricity we we run out of of kind of like different types of metals we don't run out of we run out of different foodstuffs we run out of water uh, to actually to do we run out of of trained educated employees to actually to do the job that we actually require so it looks at the kind of impact of of there and that kind of mutual benefit of there and also looks at the kind of like the impact that it actually has on on these different businesses and that Double materiality is is kind of embedded within the CSRD, which again makes it makes it sort of slightly slightly kind of different. And also this idea that it also it kind of asks the business to consider its impact not just on its own operations, but on what's kind of referred to as its whole value chain. So the impact across the whole value chain, those people who are providing kind of resources to the business. And who they provide business, uh, they they provide products or services or utilities to, and so that kind of slightly wider focus on the value chain again differentiates it from some of the um, ones which are really focused on there. Because one of the one of the kind of the claimed users is is and it's often missed in so many other standards is your business partners, the businesses your your suppliers. That you're you're kind of like customers if you're kind of business to business. So it looks at your the kind of like your whole value chain and those different people. So the information you're asked to as part of the process to, to assess the sustainability of your business model across the value chain, which again is 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 very different in terms of in terms of there. And it, actually, if you look at the global impact of value chain of procurement it's massive that's you know that's really the the real big kind of churn of activity the amount of act, the amount of kind of like value creation comes in there it's not just from the irregular financing of kind of like businesses but actually this this big huge economic engine of procurement and sale at a transactional level which is there so it's it's got that it's got that slightly different different sort of like focus there. There's a couple of differences. One is that it's it's going to be regulated. It's going to this is going to be non-optional for a whole bunch of kind of businesses. Virtually all of the other standards are voluntary. Now there's different levels of voluntary. You know, sometimes they may be a standard is then adopted by a government, say, you will comply, you know, to produce good quality reports, we would ask that you comply with a particular standard. But those standards are need to be enacted into, into there. And unless they're enacted, they're voluntary. And mm-hmm. and often they don't they, you know, they're kind of like they don't necessarily carry um sort of like any sanctions or anything for, for non non-compliance. That's normally determined by laws 
um, within within particular countries. But that's a that's a significant change. It's like it's, if you, if you qualify, it's non optional, and it needs to be uh, moved towards reasonable assurance, which again differentiates it from all of the other standards that are that are actually there. It's going to become a requirement. The other, the other thing is, is, it's going to include things like intangible assets and intangible parts of the kind of like the the business as well, and you know that's dif different sort of capitals, which is similar to the integrated reporting and maybe the kind of like you know the sort of like the the new kind of um, combination between you know integrated reporting and, and SASB. So that you've got that that focus there and that focus on business model, which again ties in with the origins and with integrated reporting kind of council, you know, they, they had that that kind of field there. So it kind of draws on the I, I almost like the best bits of other of the standards and actually there. And to be honest, if you comply with the CSRD, you're going to comply with all of the other standards, the way it's framed right now. It's not going to be worked the other way. If you comply with the current ISSB recommendations, you're not going to comply with the CSRT. If you comply with something like the GRI, you're going to be closer to the CSRD, but there's elements in there that need to be adopted. Yet, if you look at how things are planning just now, if you comply with the CSRD as it's envisaged, you will also then be GRI compliant. Because the other thing is that they're they're like like the GRI they're they're developing sector standards as well, which which does there. Another nice thing, um, certainly from uh, sustainable fintech, is that the 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 whole focus is that this is part of the within the CSRD is 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 part of the digitalization and reporting data type initiatives that the EU and other other things are there, and that the the data is going to be. Um, kind of reported in a particular format. If anyone's interested, it is XHTML kind of like format. But also, there's going to be a digital portal where you can actually upload your kind of report and data, which then means it's open and transparent to others. That's not the case with the other other standards as well. So there's going to be a data portal where you kind of upload the data. That's good, and that can be bad because you need to get your your you need to get your data in a good digital format. It needs to be structured. You need to really think about this and how it then is enabled to, to actually to do that. Arguably, it's very difficult to do that uh, for an individual company to do that on their own. That's why there's a kind of a, there's there's often a need for collaboration and engaging with sustainable fintech experts <laughs> who actually kind of have a history and experience in doing this exercise. It's it's like there's many kind of solutions out there. Don't I mean I think one thing I'd, I'd mentioned to this is don't think you have to start this from from scratch. There's many organizations who have actually been trying to do that. And certainly kind of like the work of University of Birmingham, Worldwide Generation and G17 Eco is, is, a, is a really good example of how you took something which many people a few years ago thought was like impossible to, to structure or to do. And actually with careful kind of consideration, intelligent design, best use of digital technology, have actually come up with a workable solution that actually is in place and trying to solve these problems. Mind don't don't try and solve all the problem yourself. Look at what's out there. Look at people who are experts in the field. They can help you. They can save you years of kind of like stress and uh, hair going grey and all sorts of all sorts of things like that. <laughs> and that that brings us back nicely to uh, to the, the SDGs and uh, partnership for the goals SDG seventeen yeah. as well. So that, that's that's a great place to uh, to finish on. Thank you, Ian, so much. We really appreciate okay. your time and insights, uh, and uh, just just sort of I suppose passion for companies. Um, going on a transformation process yes. with the sustainability and the sustainability reporting, not just being reporting, but actually having a huge benefit to, yes. to the, you know the people on the planet, basically, at the end of the day. Absolutely. I mean, the key thing is not to think of this as data. This is about making a difference. This is about changing the kind of like the planet, social systems, ecological systems, you know, kind of for, for future generations and other 
other kind of species on which we cohabit on the planet. If we, we mustn't think of this as data and compliance. This is about making a difference, a positive difference and a positive impact in every way that is possible to actually to do.